John 15. Most of you are still looking down, so I'll wait for you. All right, I'll begin reading in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, And my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments. And abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is God's word. Let me pray again. Just a short prayer, Lord, that I ask that you'd hear. That you would help us to see Christ more clearly. And to love him more dearly. And to follow him more nearly. Amen. Last week, we began this short look at the scene of Jesus' life. uh, There in the upper room discourse. uh, Where he had just shared Passover with his disciples. And instituted the Lord's Supper and... And at the end of chapter 14 said, let's, let's go for a walk. Uh, like I told you, I think he came upon a, a vine or a vineyard, I was told. And I've read also that there was a, a golden vine there. Uh, that perhaps maybe that's what they had come upon when Jesus uh, began to address his disciples here. And command of them and invite them into this abiding life. Um, My aim last week was to show that a a fruitful, joy-filled life is centered on Jesus Christ. That just as all roads lead to Rome, as we looked at, so do all of Jesus' words here in these 11 verses. They all lead us and point us back to, to him. And I hope you'll remember, I'll remind you if not, that Jesus gives us his reason. He tells us why he's saying the things that he's saying uh, in these 11 verses, which was not as common in all of his teachings. Uh, When he says in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you. Why? That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Everything that I'm saying here, this is why. Because I want your joy full. I want you happy. I want your joy to be full. Jesus is after your joy this morning again. He is after your happiness. And I know I I told you, I, I use those interchangeably. Joy, happiness. I know you don't like that. That's all right. I think the Bible doesn't. Uh, differentiate between the two. But I do want to just say again, I, I kind of did briefly last week, but I want to say again that th- this happiness, this joy that Jesus is after in you is not uh, a joy and happiness that we all know and love and get to experience in this world. 
this idea, this worldly understanding of, of joy and happiness, that kind of elation uh, that's based on our circumstances, uh, what you feel when you drive off the lot in the brand new car, right? You're just happy. Or that, that happiness of being popular and liked by everyone, or just the joy of, of nothing going wrong in life and you're in a pool floating with an umbrella drink, right? That's not the joy. That's not the happiness that Jesus is after in you when he says, here's why I'm saying everything that I'm saying. It's so that your joy may be full. The joy that Jesus is after is different. Why? Because it is his joy. I've said these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. It is an otherworldly, supernatural, make no sense kind of soul happiness and rest and joy that Jesus is after inside of you this morning and for the rest of your life. It's the type of happiness that when you do drive off the lot in a brand new car and a dump truck comes and T-bones your car and puts you in the hospital or your loved one in the hospital. It's a happiness that's inside of you that as you're in the hospital or sitting next to your loved one there in the hospital, it's a joy, a supernatural, otherworldly, make no sense kind of happiness that sustains and won't be taken from you and that mingles and flavors all of your suffering. It makes no sense because it's his joy. Put it in a different way, Jesus is is not saying, I want to give you my joy to add to your understanding of happiness and worldly joy. He says, I want my joy to be in you. I think what Jesus is saying, he's saying, I want my joy to come inside of you and to gut your idea of happiness and joy and evict it and replace it with my joy so that then your joy may be full. He is saying, I want my joy to be your joy so that your joy may be full because your joy will never be full apart from the true vine. It all centers on him. He is the the center and source of fullness of joy. In your presence, there is fullness Fullness of joy is what the psalmist said. And at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. All of his words here are leading us to him. Because he is the fountain and the source of a fruitful, joy-soaked, God-glorifying life. He says, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You, friends, Jonathan, you are the branches. Whoever abides in the vine, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much, much fruit, much joy. And I left you last week by saying that, by telling you that you have an enormous potential to change. You really do. There is an enormous potential in front of you, presented to you here in John 15, for you to change. Because Jesus, I think, here agrees with us when we think things and say things like, I'm never going to change. Am am I ever going to change? Am I ever going to kick this? Am I ever going to change? I think Jesus would agree with us when we say things like, I'm never going to change because he says, you can do nothing. (laughs) You can do nothing. You're a branch, Jonathan. You're a branch, GCBC. Branches can't do anything. They're, They're just hanging there. They can't produce anything at all in their life. They can't produce the fruit apart from the vine. Apart from the vine. 
So there really is a, an enormous potential for you in this invitation of Jesus because you really can't do anything. But the vine is available for you to turn back to and to connect yourself with and to stay put, to just abide with him and be with him. So what is this abiding? What does it mean to abide? And how do we do it? That's what we're after today. All right? You with me? What does it mean? But in order for us to really understand and and get moving in the direction of an abiding life, we must, and I say those words, we must on purpose, we must begin to at least grasp and to at least begin to understand an essential doctrine of the Christian life. This is an essential doctrine in order for us to even understand abiding, because if we're honest, abiding, I think, kind of feels like this far-off, super spiritual reality. To, to remain with a man who lived some 2,000 years ago, who died and was buried and rose again on the third day, abide in him. That feels otherworldly. That feels far off. That feels something that the, the monks and professionals do, not us. But when we begin to grasp and understand this doctrine of the Christian life, I hope, and I think it will, I hope that you will begin to feel as though abiding is just in the room next door. Because it really will. And this doctrine is the doctrine of our union with Christ. Union with Christ. Union really is the secret sauce for us to understand abiding. Maybe you have a recipe or somebody in your family, a, your mom or grandma, somebody makes something that is, everyone just loves. You bring a friend over for some dinner and she makes that dessert or that meal and they go home, they love it so much, they scour the internet, they're trying to figure out how do I recreate this and they, they try to make it, but what always happens? never tastes the same, does it? They say, how does she do? What is in her sauce? What is this ingredient that I'm missing? I I thought I did everything right, but it does not taste like she makes it. What is the secret? The secret to abiding is this doctrine of union. It is the secret sauce. This union with Christ, it unlocks the door, I think for us to begin to move in this direction. I would even go further to say that just as Jesus says here, apart from me, you can do nothing, that apart from at least some understanding of this doctrine of our union with Christ, you will never abide. The early Puritans would say things like, nothing is more central and basic to living the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ than union with Christ. It's just, it's basic. Dane Ortland in his book, Deeper, which I know a lot of you in the Connect group have been working through that book, and I love it. In that book, he says that union with Christ is the controlling center of what it means to be a Christian. It's this nucleus, this controlling center. It is the essence of what it means to follow him and to be his disciple. The hard thing about our union with Christ is is that it's very hard to explain, it's mysterious. I even want to use the words like enchanted and mystical. Our union with Christ is profound. It is mysterious what we are thinking about right now, that we would be united with God. And so I want to just invite you and give you permission uh, to be open to what is mysterious. Are you open to mystery with God? Yeah? 
If you're not, we should swap. You should be up here. Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. There is mystery to the, our faith. There is mystery to this doctrine of our union with Jesus. And I want to invite you to open up the eyes of your heart, to begin to use your imagination. It's a good, healthy thing, I think, for Christians to use our imagination. And this doctrine really beckons us to, and I think Scripture does. When Paul was talking about this union in Ephesians 5, you know what he said? He said this, this mystery is profound. This mystery of our union with him is so profound. And I think that's why the Bible gives us so many different pictures to try to under, understand what this means. So many different word pictures for us to think about this. So let's just use the Bible to begin to try to grasp our union with Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us that what our relationship with God is like is like the most intimate of all human relationships, marriage. Our union with him is like marriage. Before you met your spouse, it was just you. You thought about you. You talked about you. You belonged to you. You didn't have any other responsibilities besides you. When you said, I do, when two people came together, as the scriptures say, who leave father and mother and hold fast to one another, and the two shall become what? One flesh. Become one in mind, one in decisions. You become one sexually. You become one in your budget. Everything comes together and you become one. Where once before somebody would ask you to do something, you would say, let me think about that. Now you say, let us think about that. You were given an entirely new you. You became one. I love what Matthew Henry, the old commentator, said when he said that a man's children are pieces of himself, but his wife is himself. There is this interconnectedness, a union, a, a fusing of a man and a woman in a marriage relationship, and that is what it means to be united to Christ. That's what it looks like. The only other relationship that's more intimate and closer than a marriage relationship is our relationship that we have with our own bodies. We can't get any closer than that. And over and over again, the New Testament tells us that we as the church of Christ are his body. The apostle said in 1 Corinthians 11, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. You remember Saul on the Damascus Road as he's heading down that road and that brilliant light knocked him on his duff and he heard a voice from Christ say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? No. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? My body. I am so interconnected with my people that they are my body. When you persecute them, when you throw them in jail, when you give them over to murder and hang, be a, a coat hanger to watch the stoning of Stephen, you are persecuting me, my body. That's what it's like to be united with him. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is discussing sexual immorality and he says, don't you, don't you know, my paraphrase, don't you know that, that you are members of Christ's body? So how could you take the members of Christ's body and join them with a prostitute? You know what he's saying? He's saying, you cannot sleep with a prostitute and not have Jesus involved because you are the body of Jesus. Whatever touches you 
touches him. There is a union between you and Christ. Peter takes a different route and gives us a picture of a temple when he says that you are like a living stone. All of us are like living stones who are coming together to form this temple for God to dwell in. And at the cornerstone is Christ, that precious cornerstone that all of us as living stones are being connected and integrally brought together through that stone, being our foundation. We're all brought together. We're, we're being brought and built together as this house, this temple for God to dwell in. There is a union between us and him. And Jesus himself gives us here in John 15, I think one of the greatest pictures, one of my favorite pictures of what it means to be united with him. He doesn't say, does he? Here's what it's like, guys. It's like a, two friends who got to live in houses across the street from each other who just really enjoy one another's company. They go outside in their lawn chairs, they talk all the time. He says, I am the vine. And you are the branches. The branches that are organically connected to me, in me, and I as the vine am organically connected to you, and my nutrients and my sap are coming into you. I'm in you. You are in me. We are one unit. There is a union about you, Christian, and God through Jesus Christ. That's amazing. John Stott points out that Christian, the word Christian, is only used three times in our New Testament. Only used three times. Jesus and Paul never used the word. But in Paul's letters alone, the phrases of in Christ and in him and in the Lord, in Paul's letters alone, are, it's used 164 times. And those That language is all over this, isn't it? Abide in me and I in you. To be in union with Christ simply means that Christ is in you and you are in Christ. There is a union. He is wed to you. You are like a building of cement blocks connected to the cornerstone. You're a body. Is your head connected to your body? I hope mostly, right? You feel it? Thing's going to lead you all the rest of the day. It's going to tell you what to eat. It's going to tell you where to walk. It's going to tell you everything. Just as your head right now is connected to your body, so are you connected to Christ who is your head. And by the way, he's the head of this church. He is the head of Grace Community Bible Church. Tony ain't. I'm not. Travis ain't. Jesus Christ is the head of Grace Community Bible Church, and he will be the head of her forever. I'd love to take you to Galatians 2. I just don't have the time, but go there later and just look at one verse, verse 20, and just look at this union with Christ. I think one of the clearest understandings of what it means when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ when I, when I came to faith through your grace, opening my eyes, I was crucified. His name was Saul. Saul died. He so identifies with us and we with him that his death becomes our death. I have been crucified with Christ. In the life I now, uh, pardon me, it is no longer I who live. I don't live, Paul says. But now Christ who lives where? In me. And very practically how that works out is the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. It really does take faith. So I really hope you'll hear this. Christianity is not something that you come to believe in and believing in a God that remains outside of you. Our faith in following Christ 
is believing in something and believing in someone who then takes up residence inside of you. He's in you. He does not remain outside of you. He's in you. How does he do that? If you're in John 15, just look over at verse 15 of chapter 14. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, here it is, for he dwells with you and will be in you. How are we unified with Christ, united to him through the Holy Spirit? That's this helper. When you came to faith, in that moment, God's love was poured into your hearts, Romans 5 tells us, through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 tells us if you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, you're not his. This is how... We are in union with Christ through the Holy Spirit. And maybe this will be the only thing you need to hear today. Do you notice there in John 14 that he doesn't call the Holy Spirit an it? Did you know it's not an it? You know him, he says, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. So maybe just that whole switch of this is not some weird force or some it, but this is the third person of our Godhead, the Holy Spirit that I can relate to who is in me. He's the one convicting me. He's the one drawing me in these different ways. Christ is in you, and you are in Christ. What this means very simply is that because you're in him, you are completely safe. You are completely safe in Christ. He is your refuge. No one, no thing is ever going to be able to get you out of him. He won't cast you out. You are his, you are his, you are his. You are in him and will remain in him by faith. And because he's in you... you have an enormous potential to change. (laughs) You have an enormous potential and resource within you to change and to bear much fruit. Your face isn't showing it to me, but hopefully this illustration that Rankin Wilborn uses in his book that I think is one of the greatest books written on this doctrine of our union with Christ. It's called Union with Christ, the way to know and enjoy God. It's been so helpful and so refreshing uh, to me. But he gave this illustration that really just kind of gave me language to understand what I was feeling this past week as I've been refreshed in this doctrine and remembering that he's in me and I'm in him. There's this union The illustration he tells is about imagining if growing up with your parents, you never saw eye to eye with them, constantly fought with your parents. You couldn't stand your parents. They couldn't stand you. It didn't seem like anything you could do would make them proud. You were a constant disappointment to them and vice versa. You never got along. But then one day... As you were helping move some boxes around in the house and you were up in the attic, you found an old dusty trunk and you began to brush that dust off of the trunk and you somehow picked the lock and got into that trunk and you began kind of rummaging through that trunk and you saw all these different pictures of people that you had never seen before in your life. You started going through all this paperwork in there, and your name kept coming up. It was all over this paperwork. And wouldn't you know it, you came to find out that when you were a baby, you were abducted. These aren't your parents. And you think to yourself, I knew it. 
I knew these weren't my parents. I never liked these people. They never liked me. I knew something was different about me from them. And what you come to find out is, is that your mom is an artist. She's a painter in Paris. And your dad is a Nobel Prize winning scientist and a professional baseball player. (laughs) And you keep reading and you find out that your parents are just stupid wealthy. And there is a lush inheritance waiting for you. What Wilborn says is such a discovery like that would cause you to reinterpret everything about your life. You would reinterpret who you are, your identity, where you came from, your capacities and your capabilities, the resources that are available to you and finding out who your new parents are. Are and all they have available to you, your future would look totally different in coming to find this out. You would never be the same from that day forward. And as I've been refreshed in my union with Christ, that illustration just kind of gave me a, a feeling, a, a, a picture that as you come to realize and know that the holy, holy God and creator of this universe has chosen by his grace to make his home in you, you should reinterpret everything about who you are and your identity and your capacities and your capabilities and the resources that are available to you, even in your suffering, because he is in you and you're in him so hopefully let me ask you does does abiding feel maybe a little closer I hope so I was in our room last night and Melissa was out in the living room and I just thought this is as simple as it is she's right there I can just get up and walk out there and be with her. Jesus is right there. You can get up and go be with him and stay with him. So what does it then mean for us to just abide in him? Jesus says in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. What is this abiding? A few years ago, I was working with my counselor None of your business. I was working. No, I was working with my counselor, and she was helping me see just how black and white I can be, just how linear I can think and, and functionally live. And we were talking through Paul's words in Ephesians four, where he says, "Speaking the truth in love." And you know what she said to me was, "Jonathan, speaking the truth in love is not a science." Why? Because every situation in your life is not going to be the same. They're all so drastically different. They're like snowflakes. Yes, the truth is the truth. It will not bend. It will not flex. But speaking the truth in love is not A plus B equals C for everything. You know what she said? She said, Jonathan, it's not a science. It is an art. That's been so helpful for me. It's not A plus B equals C. It's more like dancing. It's more like painting. It's more like making music. And you know what all of the arts require? Lots and lots of practice. Lots and lots of practice. I used to play guitar quite a bit. I was in a couple of bands, and I still love it. But now it just hangs up in my in my study and you know what i've lost the art i'm not nearly as fluid with it so to begin with i think we need to understand and know that abiding in jesus is not a science it's an art and it takes a lot of practice 
But don't forget that everything that I have been saying about our union with Christ, in a way, really doesn't take practice because that is a, one of the most beautiful black and white truths that you will ever know and hear today, that your union with Christ is secure. He says in his word, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Before he stood on that cloud and ascended to the Father, he said, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You are safe and secure in Jesus Christ, and no one and no thing is ever going to change your union with Christ. Amen? That's secure. That's done. What changes and fluctuates is not our union with Christ, but rather our communion with him, our abiding with him. And abiding with him, it is an art. It is the art of practicing our union now let me give it to you in a sentence as best I can. What is abiding? Abiding in Christ is the art of attending awareness. Abiding is the art of attending awareness. So let me just ask you a, a kind of a silly question. I want to ask it to you. Are you breathing right now? Good. I'm glad you are. Now focus on your breathing. Let's take a few moments and just focus on it. Inhale. Exhale. Focus on that breathing. You're breathing. And you know what? All morning long, maybe even all week long, you have been breathing, but for the very first time today or maybe this week, you are suddenly aware that you're breathing and you're attending to your breath. Ever since Christ came into your life and drew you to himself with his irresistible grace, you just couldn't say no and you flung yourself Onto him. He filled you with his Holy Spirit. He made his home inside of you. And all day long, every single day, all week long, he is with you. You're just never aware and attending to that reality. Jesus said to the church, to his people, to whom he inhabits, in Revelation 3, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone would open that door, I will come with him and have dinner with him and be with him. So abiding is the art, the practice of attending awareness that Jesus is is knocking, that he's there, that he's with you, and he is in you. That's what it is. But we have a huge problem, and we have a great enemy to the abiding life in Christ. And I've really felt led to just kind of spend the rest of our time to talk about this enemy But before I do, I want to ask you, are you still aware that you're breathing? Probably not a lot of you, right? You forget? That's the enemy. We are a distracted, distracted people. We are constantly being bombarded by distraction from our enemies which the scriptures tell us in Ephesians 2 that you probably know are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And each one of these is, is just hammering us with such an easy ammunition of theirs to just distract us, to just 
calm us, to pacify us from the reality that God is with us and he is in us. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We live in a world that literally makes its profits, makes its monies. Economies are swirling around, not so much like they were in the old days of what we built and produced. Profits are being made in this world by our attention. You are the product as you scroll and scroll and scroll. Andrew Sullivan wrote in the New Yorker, now eight years ago, now hold that, eight years ago he wrote this, okay? This was before TikTok. Eight years ago, Andrew Sullivan wrote this, quote, every single minute on the planet, every single minute, eight years ago, YouTube users upload 400 hours of video and Tinder users swipe profiles over a million times. Each day, there are literally billions of Facebook likes. He says this, Do not flatter yourself in thinking that you have much control over which temptations you click on. Silicon Valley's technologists and their ever-perfecting algorithms have discovered the form of bait that will have you jumping like a witless minnow. just called you a witless minnow. Have you jumping. He says this, No information technology ever had this depth of knowledge of its consumers or a greater capacity to tweak their synapses to keep them engaged. That is the world we live in, of distraction. In our own flesh, works hard at distracting ourselves. One scholar said that all the rings and dings and notifications of this life has produced a people who have a plasticity of attention. Remember when Jesus went and prayed, he told his disciples, stay here and pray. How did he find them? Sleeping, yeah. And he said those words, guys, the spirit indeed is willing, but that flesh of yours is so weak. It is so weak, so distracted, so easily pulled and drawn by so many different things pulled to the next shiny thing, pulled to the next sense of pleasure, pulled, here it is, really, in so many ways, pulled to the next fastest answer. A.J. Swoboda, I was given a book by him called After Doubt, and he writes in this book that we suffer from a kind of reflective poverty. I love that statement so much that we suffer from a reflective poverty. He writes this, quote, patient reflection is gone. Rather than going deep, we go wide. In our fervor to scratch our soul's itches, we rush to the podcast, YouTube channel, or favorite celebrity to help ease the pain of the unanswered questions. We opt for quick answers to our hard questions rather than hard answers that result from long, difficult, toilsome reflection. Just don't know about this in my faith. Tony preached on doubt. I'll go to this guy and listen to this podcast. Just distracted by all these different things flying at us. Even really good, I used the word last week, I'll use it again, even really good, honorable, churchy-looking things distract us. Things that we think are doing something for us are good. You remember when Jesus entered into a village once and a woman by the name of Martha opened her door. Said, come on in. I'll fix you something to eat. She had a sister called Mary that the text tells us just sat at Christ's feet to hear him teach. But Martha was distracted by much serving. And the Lord looked at her and said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about much. 
about many things, but one thing is necessary, and your sister Mary has chosen the good portion which will never be taken from her. We are so distracted. And the devil knows that he could never take away our relationship and our union with Christ. And because he knows that, he too works really, really hard at distracting us, at pulling us in so many ways and tempting us and drawing us away. I'm sure you've heard of C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, where this book is a series of letters from a senior demon named Screwtape to his nephew, junior demon, Wormwood, encouraging him in the work of these devilish things, these demons. In one of his letters, he writes this, you will find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book, which he really likes to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements and yesterday's paper will do. Remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. That's God. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. What a quote that is for our generation. Murder is no better than cards if cards will do the trick. And indeed, it's been his tactic, or at least one of them since the beginning, when he said, did God really say that you can't eat from any of these trees? He knows when you look at this tree, dangles it out in front of her. When you eat of this, you'll become like him. You'll be like God. He tempts and he pulls and he distracts us because if he can get our heart's eyes and the mind that we have in Christ away from the reality that God dwells within us by his Holy Spirit. That's all. He doesn't have to work very hard. Did you forget you're still breathing? You did. So quickly we forget our union. With Christ. Abiding in Him is the art of the attending awareness of His presence. I think that's why Brother Lawrence called it practicing the presence of God. We practice it, living aware that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. It's so mysterious, but I'll have faith to believe it. To remain aware and progressively live nearer and nearer to him and you'll get distracted and you'll have to come back again and work at it and practice it and practice it but like any good artist after a while you know what it becomes like it becomes like breathing where you're just so fluid with it and you live in the awareness of the presence of Christ. I'll give you a practice maybe from Jesus' words here in John 15 that I love. How he set it up here in verse 4 when he says, abide in me and I in you. You can literally inhale one breath and, and recite to yourself, abide in me. And you can exhale, and I in you. Abide in me, and I in you. And let that move you into his presence. And maybe I'm wrong, just a few minutes here. Maybe I'm wrong to not bring you to all of the good practices that will usher you into this awareness. But I'm just simply trusting and believing that you know what those are. You know you should be reading your Bible. You don't want to hear a preacher say, read your Bible. We've heard it a million times. You know you should read your Bible. You know you should go to your secret place and pray with him. You know that you should throw in a few times a month a fast and practice Sabbath and, and silence and solitude. All of these things are tools of the trade 
of abiding in Jesus, of just staying with him. I think it was John Mark Comer who said it's like a trellis that just helps hold up those branches where they should be, reading your scripture and prayer. These things will bring you there. But to abide is to just remain. That's what it means. Stay put. Dwell with him. Just be with him. And I was given by A.J. Swoboda in that book my new favorite picture of what it means to abide. And it all has to do with the shoes. All of my kids have done it so far, where when I get home from work or from somewhere and maybe we eat dinner together and we're all in the living room and I have my feet propped up, my shoes are still on, all of my kids, for whatever reason, are incessant to take my shoes off. They crawl over, they try untying them, they're trying as hard as they can with their little fingers to get my shoes off. They'll peel my socks off, I'll throw them at them, they'll throw them at me. But for whatever reason, they want my shoes off. If I have to run out to go to the grocery store or run to see somebody, maybe in the church or something, I have to go in my room and change my clothes, put my shoes on. As they come out of my room, they notice and they scan me up and down and see that I've changed my clothes, but their eyes will always land on my shoes, and then they'll meet my eyes and they'll say, where are you going? And I think if they could communicate it, what they would say is, Dad, whenever your shoes are on, you have somewhere else to be. But when your shoes are off, you have nowhere else to be. I think what Jesus is inviting us here when he says, abide in me and I in you, I think what he's saying is, take your shoes off. And stay a while. Because we're not just distracted, but we privilege everywhere else except right here. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit unless they abide in me, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, he it is that bears so much joy and so much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So, Father, I just pray now and ask for my friends and I that you would help us to live aware that you're not just with us, but that you are in us. We need your help, Lord. We lift up the shield of faith against all distraction and all sin. And, Lord, we bless your name that we're safe and secure in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great week, church.